Um, I'm now very pleased to turn the mic over to my colleague, Caroline Fox, who is the network manager of our um, national uh, network of the SDSN USA. And she will walk us through the next session on how businesses are addressing sustainability, happiness, and also COVID-19. Caroline, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to everyone joining from around the world. Thank you, Dorothea, uh, for that introduction. And hello, my name is Caroline Fox. As Dorothea mentioned, I lead the SDSN USA network at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. As we begin, I'd like to say hello to continuing viewers and welcome our next panelists and those of you just joining for the first time during this 24-hour webinar event as SDSN celebrates the Earth Day's, Earth Day's 50th anniversary. I'm pleased to introduce the next session, which will explore world happiness and well-being in the business community. I'm pleased to introduce Sharon Pakalor, who will be moderating the session. Sharon is the manager of special projects for the director at the uh, for the director at the Center for Sustainable Development, overseeing projects including the World Happiness Report, the Global Happiness Council, Science and Ethics for Happiness, and Ethics and Action programs for New York City and the Vatican. Sharon, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Happy Earth Day, um, Sharon Pakalor. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Caroline. Um, I'm manager of the World Happiness Report. And so we are thanking everyone for joining us, um, WHR and SDSN, on this session on business sustainability and happiness. Uh, today, we will have Professor Jeffrey Sachs, co-editor of the World Happiness Report, Davide Bolati of Davines International, uh, Paul Pullman, uh, chair of the uh, International Chambers of Commerce, of the UN and co-founder of Imagine. We have Eric Izikeli, I hope I pronounced that correctly, of regenerative, a regenerative entrepreneur. And we also have Jan Emanuel uh, Deniv, who is also co-editor of the World Happiness Report and also director of the Wellbeing Research Center at Oxford University. And without further ado, uh, who will be leading in this conversation is Professor Jeffrey Sachs. So Jeff, uh, may you please take <laughs> the reins. Eric, thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, Sharon. And uh, thanks to all of the uh, SDSN uh, chapters around the world. We just heard a wonderful uh, session from Northern Europe. Uh, this uh, world celebration of uh, Earth Day began uh, 12 hours ago in East Asia uh, with Hong Kong. Uh, it has uh, been circling the world as now we're waking up in New York and we're going to be uh, having a transatlantic uh, discussion this morning. Uh, I want to say hello to everybody and uh, hope that everybody is well and uh, safe uh, in a very uh, unusual and difficult time. We're certainly uh, at the most extraordinary moment in world history of recent decades so uh, in a situation essentially uh, uh, that was not imagined and was uh, basically unimaginable uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, most of the world uh, is in lockdown. We're here uh, visiting with each other today uh, on uh, video conference, which has become our normal mode of uh, life in recent weeks. Uh, and we're trying to hold together uh, a world that is under phenomenal stress uh, because of an economy that has been deliberately uh, shut down in large measure in order to try to contain the pandemic. At the same time, uh, we're trying to continue our lives uh, and uh, to uh, manage uh, our well-being and the well-being of our friends and colleagues and families. And we're also trying to uh, discern in the midst of uh, this confusing moment uh, a way forward for the world. Uh, not only are we under stress, from the pandemic itself and from its economic fallout, but we're under stress politically as well. Uh, the world's uh, seeing accusations thrown in one direction or another, the multilateral system 
itself is uh, under strain. We have a lot to talk about this morning, and uh, we're very privileged to have some outstanding uh, business leaders, uh, people who have shown for many, many years uh, not only great business acumen and great skill in management, which is a talent that we really need, we need to manage, but have also combined that remarkable management skill with a uh, great heart. Uh, we are joined today by uh, some of the uh, iconic figures of the sustainable development movement and the sustainable business movement, to people who have led the formation of uh, the B Corp movement. We're going to hear more about that uh, shortly, uh, and uh, who have become world leaders in promoting uh, climate safety and the sustainable development goals and the role of responsible business in helping to meet those global objectives. Uh, without further ado, I would like to turn to our first panelist. Uh, um, I hope the panelists are on and uh, hearing all right, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll do the best as we go through with the program. But I'm absolutely delighted uh, that uh, Davide Bolate, who uh, is uh, the president and owner of uh, Davines uh, International, uh, is with us uh, in Italy. Uh, and uh, Davide is a partner of SDSN in the World Happiness Agenda, uh, the World Happiness Report, and uh, many of our activities related to it. Uh, he's also a great leader of uh, business uh, sustainable uh, development responsibility and one of the world leaders of the B Corp movement. Uh, Davide, are you uh, on and hearing me and can you uh, join at this moment? Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. All right, now we see you. Where are you? I'm uh, at the Davines village. We are uh, we are working. Uh, we are we keep the village and the, the production site uh, open, but we are running at uh, the engine uh, uh, at minimum at minimum speed. So we have we have let's say half uh, half open. Can you tell? So, I mean, uh, just uh, geographically, where uh, the facilities are located and how the epidemic affected you? Uh, we are based in, in Parma, Italy, in the northern uh, part of Italy, and uh, we are a, a manuf manufacturer of beauty products. So, uh, yes, COVID has affected us very much because uh, the majority of all our clients around the world are closed at the moment. Uh, so of course uh, we have uh, it has been uh, affected. So now we are in the in this uh, in this time we are uh, working on reopening and uh, redefining uh, what to do in in the future um, in this uh, on the on this in today's economy. David, was you, was your workforce uh, hit by the epidemic itself? Yeah, um, we have around 700 people in the company. Uh, around 1% has been hit. A couple of uh, um, my colleagues have been to hospital. One has been hospitalized uh, uh, up to intensive care, but uh, uh, thank God everything is uh, fine now. Everybody's uh, uh, recovered, and so we are uh, we are lucky uh, because, as you know, uh, Italy has been hit pretty hard. Yeah, Italy and uh, New York, we seem to have become the, the two centers of this, uh, at least, you know, for that moment when the uh, disease passed through. Is is there a sense that Italy is now coming out from the other side of, of the crisis? Yes, uh, we see that we are uh, we are seeing the light after the tunnel, uh, the, but uh, there are still uncertainties uh, in, uh, uh, you know, when and uh, and uh, Especially how uh, the uh, the reopening will be, uh, because of the there will there, there are uh, uncertainties of different uh, uh, segments of the of the commerce, and uh, uh, probably um, the reopening will affect uh, uh, the way uh, the way we we used to do business in the past. So many changes have to happen that will impact the productivity 
efficiency, cost, and so it has to be um, rethought. And uh, and uh, you will lose uh, in some areas, and then uh, probably you can also uh, gain in others because uh, in these days we have learned on uh, uh, that maybe all this traveling is not necessary. All this. Uh, uh physical interaction is not necessary even though uh, physical interaction i believe is still very important for for human beings and uh, uh yes so we we we, are, we will try to uh to make uh, to 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 have a more less impactful ways of uh, interacting with each other in terms of also uh, environment uh, but uh, can we uh, substitute uh, physicality totally i don't think so uh, for sure, that uh, tragedy of COVID uh, also opened open us uh, mm, new ways of working that are maybe uh, milder for the environment. Uh, and that is, uh, that is something that it's a lesson that we should uh, treasure. Have, have you been able to move uh, part of the company's processes online, at least, you know, the management and uh finance and other operations yes of course uh, the, the, now we are working on uh, on uh, remote on smart business and and on different type of uh, conferences yes that has been uh, uh, there has not been a loss of um, efficiency apparently very good david i wanted to uh, have you explained uh, you've explained to me personally and it's been fascinating but i'd like you to explain to uh, the people listening in and uh, and the thousands who will be watching uh, the session uh, about the b corp movement uh, which you've been one of the pioneers and founders we're going to have uh, eric uh Ali as well uh, who is a colleague of yours and uh, as I understand it, uh, uh, Nativa was the first of the B Corp uh, in Italy. Can you explain this movement and how it relates to our two great themes, sustainable development and uh, to well-being and happiness? Uh, you're a champion of both of those ideas. Yes, Jeffrey. Uh, well, B Corps uh, are companies that have uh, uh, a higher purpose and they have a different uh, objective than let's say classic uh, corporate world. In classic corporate world, the uh, end uh, objective of an organization is to uh, maximize the return on shareholders, is a shareholder supremacy. Uh, B Corps are companies that uh, uh, acknowledge the principle of interdependence and, uh, and because of that they uh, they incorporate externalities. Uh, they take into account externalities in uh, in the business model, and they consider um, all the stakeholders at large as a, a objective of the business. So, yes, of, the first, of of course, the shareholders, but shareholders as long as the environment, as long as uh, um, the the human resources, uh, the the communities, the good citizenships, uh, suppliers. So it's the whole supply chain is involved, and that is a uh, that is um, uh, this declaration of interdependence. I think is also a declaration of uh, of resilience uh, because uh, in, in uh, it is a uh, uh, you know we are, we are going through uh, crises that are social, that are uh, environmental that are um, economic uh, sometimes now we're going through a, a health crisis and uh, there are a lot of correlations between all these different crises there are uh, for sure uh, con con contributing causes uh, to each one of them so uh, by acknowledging uh, the stakeholders that are around the company and rec recognizing their importance and their value I think uh, it's uh, it's a um, good way to make your your uh, business more resistant, more resilient, and also uh, closer to what the consumer today are demanding to companies. Uh, uh, there is a, an increasing co consumer demand, consumer expectation. Um, generally speaking, that uh, calls for 
companies that have a, uh, more uh, social responsibilities, companies that are uh, going, uh, that, uh, that uh, offer an, an overall uh, uh, output that goes, uh, that has a higher purpose. <laughs> I think it's uh, very important and very wise for you to underscore uh, resilience, uh, not only of society, which we obviously need, but of companies as well, because uh, these uh, shareholder only perspectives can lead to a kind of brittleness. Uh, you know, everything is put in one direction. You don't care about anything else, but the, the bottom line and it ends up when the world changes, uh, you end up uh, completely in a state of collapse. And I'm, of course, thinking about a lot of the oil companies right now. It's a little bit uh, sad and uh, pathetic to me, actually, to see America's uh, big oil companies coming to the U.S. government for bailouts. Uh, they have been, you know, among the most aggressive lobbyists against sustainability. Uh, now that this crisis has hit, in addition to the shift of demand away from oil because of climate, uh, now they don't have resilience. Uh, their business model was based on something that uh, in the end of the day, we don't really need. Uh, and now their only survival mode is actually running to government for survival rather than, as you said, meeting the real needs of society. So I think that this underscoring that multi-stakeholder is not only to be nice but it is to be resilient it's to make a company that can really find its way through harder times also is extremely important i think resilience is also uh, applying the principle of precaution because uh, right now you know especially in these days we are all becoming scientists we are all becoming virologists uh, and we are learning so much about uh, this new uh, pandemic. Uh, but um, um, until a few months ago, when uh, also we had other type of uh, scientists that were advising us uh, to be careful uh, in dealing with ecosystems, in dealing with climate change, in dealing with the global warming. And um, sometimes uh, we tend not to, uh, to forget about it and to postpone and not to listen. So uh if if we go back to resilience and resisting to or 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 to, to building more sustainable business uh precautionally i think it is uh, worthwhile as a humanity that inhabit uh, this planet that is uh that um, before was uh, abundant uh, that offer very abundant uh, resources to all of us but now beca because we are becoming so numerous now we are 7.5 billion going to 10 billion uh it it we go from abundance to scarcity so uh, let's be more precautious and let's uh, be uh, let's think about uh, preventing uh, the next one the next epidemic so the next crisis thank you for the wise words please uh, stay with us if you can i'm, I'm going to uh, ask paul pullman to join us uh, right now uh, paul if you could uh, um come uh, with your camera uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, you're on mute uh, still. Uh, let me uh, unmute say it. a word about you, Paul, because uh, I want to embarrass you. Uh, you're <laughs> you're uh, you're the world's uh, leading uh, business voice for uh, rationality, sanity, decency, sustainable development. Uh, you became really the iconic figure of the sustainable development movement in the business community uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, it's it's not an accident. I can say it, uh, I want to say it to everybody, uh, you're an extraordinary person and really an extraordinary leader. Uh, when we had the chat a few weeks ago uh, about leadership on sustainable development, you taught me a lot about not only the concepts, but how you put them into business operation. Davida uh, does the same. Uh, now, uh, thank goodness, uh, you're also a chair of the International Chamber of Commerce. That's a really important venue for the world uh, at, at this moment. And Paul, if I could ask you to start uh, on COVID also, uh, you know, the business community is facing 
like all of society, uh, an absolutely extraordinary crisis. On the one hand, business has to continue, not not just for the economy, but for our survival. Uh, the, val the supply chains uh, globally have to continue to operate. Uh, we need food shipped internationally. We need uh, manufactured goods shipped internationally. We can't stock out of uh, our daily necessities, and yet people are at risk. Uh, workers uh, want to have a safe environment. Businesses uh, don't have customers necessarily or can't be sure. So I don't think any of us has seen anything, even we can make an analogy, uh, really, uh, to what we're facing right now. Uh, I certainly can't in 40 years of working on economic crises. I've never seen anything like this. I just wonder, given your wisdom and experience, tell us something about this crisis in, in terms of what it means for world business. Yeah, no, thanks, Debbie. And obviously, uh, it was very interesting to listen to uh, David as well. There are 2,800 B corporations now in the world. And I was very fortunate that uh, many of them were associated with Unilever and, and uh, went together with us because it made our business model so much better. And one of the good things coming out of this crisis might indeed be that more companies understand the importance of purpose and multi-stakeholder models. And I can get into that later. I'm also glad that you combine happiness and sustainable development goals, because that is nearly the same. If we really would achieve the sustainable development goals and get a more inclusive and sustainable and equitable uh, world, first of all, we would not have been in the current crisis. And secondly, uh, we would have uh, a global economy that frankly would function better for all of us including the ones that currently think they get the benefits but are actually probably more uh, part of, of the problems if i may be honest so this is definitely one of the biggest crises uh, if not the biggest uh, in economic terms uh, jeffrey it is bigger than what we've seen in the great depression it's certainly bigger than the financial crisis and and in both of them you might argue we didn't do a very good job coming out of this in a way that we should have in the in the original uh, Great Depression that we had, um, we ended up in Europe with a World War uh, II. Uh, also there, we uh, learned our lessons from World War I. Um, we, we took a while to get uh, into camaraderie. We created the European Union and a, and a long time of prosperity. The financial crisis, I've always said uh, from, from a citizen's point of view, banks were too big to fail, but people too small to matter and to some extent not addressing fully the issues in the financial crisis from 2008. We're actually dealing now with a much bigger crisis than we've had before. Uh, the, the International Chamber of Commerce uh, represents about 45 million companies uh, across the world and is probably uh, it is the biggest uh, business organization. We've drastically changed the agenda. Instead of just fighting for trade, uh, the, the International Chamber of Commerce was established as merchants of peace. The idea was in uh, 1919, after the First World War, that if we could make countries more interdependent in trade, then there would be less chances of war, hence the title merchants of peace. But it was very much figured on opening up trade. So it was a good purpose, to be honest. But then it got translated into just freeing the borders. And what we've seen with globalization is it clearly is a better thing than not having globalization. Let's take the, the, the vaccine that we now need. It's, I'm glad that the whole world works together on that and hopefully we can make that available to everybody. That's the benefit of globalization to some extent. But we haven't taken care too much of the people that, had, uh, that suffered from this globalization that were left behind. So the International Chamber of Commerce had changed its agenda. We've now put very high on the agenda, make climate change everybody's business. We've put very high on the agenda make global trade work for everybody so that we get to a more um, sustainable and more equitable future. The biggest issues still being climate change and inequality. What um, we see in this crisis that uh, unemployment could reach up to uh, 150 to 200 million people. We're 22 million in the US right now. Uh, the numbers don't count uh, the ones that are in the informal economy in many industries like tourism and travel or restaurants or food and agriculture, you have an informal economy. Oxfam estimates that 500 million people can slip back again below the poverty line, which is $1.95 a day. We cannot even imagine living on that. So we have a real social crisis 
And it is clear that although people say this uh, coronavirus affects everybody, it's actually not true. It affects the poor more. In your country, we see the Hispanic and the uh, Afro-American population suffering. We see the poorer people that are already subject to more air pollution and less access to health uh, being a disproportionate victims. And now it is ravaging across the emerging markets where there are no healthcare systems and, uh, and very difficult when people live in these crowded um, um, slums, if I may say, and other areas. So this is not an equal virus. This affects again the ones that continue to pay the price of our irresponsibilities. So we want to address that. The Chamber of Commerce has focused first and foremost, very briefly, working with the World Health Organization, Tedros and his team, uh, an enormous network. So how do we organize for PPE material, this personal protective equipment? Um, how do we get companies to produce where there are shortages? How do we get the products at the right places? It's not that easy. We've also advocated that the countries would be more responsible. 77 countries have put export barriers in place. Interestingly, they've eased import barriers, but they've put export barriers in place. If there's one learning, Jeffrey, from this crisis for me, is that the black swan is not the corona virus. Corona virus, because the viruses are now happening every three, four, five years. This is a particularly uh, difficult one. But the real black swan has been the inability of our leadership, our governments to work together. We have seen them uh, fight for their own ship, um, being late in response, turning it into a political propaganda machine. And there are obviously exceptions, but in, in, in essence, we are dealing now with enormous consequences in your country or in some others because of the uh, in, in attitude uh, or in experience or inability of our politicians to behave like adults, to be honest. And, and I think the people are getting fed up of that. So the, the International Chamber of Commerce tries to fight for keeping the borders open, tries to ensure that we get more money towards the SMEs. The US just released another 500 million today. Uh, the SMEs are 85 to 90 percent of the global economy. About 30 percent are about to disappear, and that's not a good thing. So next to um, safeguarding our lives and working on the health crisis, we're also looking at the livelihoods and ensuring that these businesses can continue to exist. It is much better if we can keep people in employment than if we obviously have to um, have them unemployed when in many countries you don't have the social network or the social safety nets that are needed. And now increasingly, we're starting to think of um, redesigning where we go out. I would not talk about recovery or restarting our global economy. I would really talk about re uh, redesigning our economy. We've been able to put over $10 trillion uh, in when all this is done. We might have to spend $20 trillion, depending on how long this lasts. And we need to be sure that we spend it very wisely. And next to putting in better governance systems and making it more resilient to deal with these crises, we also see businesses really demanding business, different business models. It is very difficult to generalize business behavior. We've seen some behavior that is not acceptable, but increasingly that's being called out as being non-acceptable by governments, by citizens of this world, and interestingly, increasingly by the financial uh, world. But broadly, to stay positive, I see the bulk of the business community responding. They've taken salary cuts, they're protecting their employees, they've reconfigured their um, supply chains to help, and actually amazing partnerships are happening. Pharma companies that go together and make their patents open or combine research, hotels that go together, convert into hospitals. We see the fashion industry going together, making face masks and gowns. And so these alliances, um, uh, especially on the social part of ESG has definitely uh, come to the foreground. I think also that because of this crisis, people are now starting to understand the link between biodiversity, health and climate change. And that is a very important thing as well. There is no doubt that as we um, deal with this virus, people are starting to understand that the disrespect we've had for our biodiversity, the engrossment of the wildlife 75% uh, of the viruses actually come from wildlife, engrossing that into human life and that intermixing climate change, obviously making it significantly worse, that we need to address that. And we cannot solve it um, 
by by uh, only restarting an economy and not taking care of uh, safeguarding biodiversity and our climate because we'd be in worse situations uh, at a significantly faster interval moving forward. So we're thinking of that redesign, which means redesigning our social system, our healthcare system. It's clearly not designed for what we're facing. Redesigning our food system, uh, moving to a greener economy, and then obviously redesigning our governance and resilience system and how to deal with stuff. I would want to end very briefly um, on the emerging markets because that lack of solidarity and that's our main concern right now is especially shown in the emerging markets where the pandemic is going to hit in a very serious way partly because you have the, the Maduras or the Bolsonaros or the uh, Obradors uh, who continue to encourage their people to hug each other but you also have many countries in Africa that desperately would want to find solutions but don't have resilience. So we do need to get the debt relief for these countries. Just postponement doesn't make any sense. If we just cancel the debt and cancel the payments, then these countries actually have the money to uh, invest in dealing with this crisis, at least making it better and putting in more resilient systems. It is incomprehensible to me that we in Europe and the US can quickly put together the 10 trillion more or less that we've talked about at the end of the day and not even have the courage to put 100 billion down 100 billion versus 10 trillion for a climate fund or it takes 37 billion to give safety nets to the to the 30 poorest countries in this world and we're not even willing to talk it we have finance minister navel gazing we have the the heads of state writing tweets to each other as if they're little children so it is time that the citizens of this world speak up it is time that we make this Earth Day movement, let's not forget that's why we are here, a global movement of 365 days a year and, and hopefully uh, translate that very soon and getting the right politicians in office. And we in the ICC as one organization, and obviously there are other organizations that should be complemented, but we're trying to continue to keep people focused on the most important things that count, which is human oh. lives right now. Paul, thank you for a remarkable statement and a remarkable leadership. And thank you for reminding us this is essentially the 100th anniversary of the ICC with its history at the end of uh, right. World War I. And uh, 25 years after that, after one more world war uh, came the UN. So we have the 75th anniversary of the UN uh, as well. When I was uh, going to, uh, uh, to school, to grad school a long time ago, <laughs> We read a, uh, a a book which was a, a pivotal book which needs to come back into uh, Rachel Carlson understanding by Charles Kindleberger who was a great mm -hmm. MIT economic historian a wonderful man lots of wisdom and he wrote a book called The World in Depression and his thesis was that one of the reasons why the Great Depression was uh, so devastating and uh, and uh, of course with such horrific consequences was that the international leadership failed and it failed in his view because we were between leaders in a way uh, the uk was no longer the global leader that it uh, had been maybe a generation earlier the united states was not responsible and not looking after global leadership in the 1930s as it would come to do in the 1950s and 1960s and so Kindleberger said we were between leadership. And I taught that idea uh, uh, called hegemonic stability theory for many years in the classroom. Uh, but I never thought I would live to see the drama of it because we are in exactly the situation now where the question of global leadership is the central question. Uh, in we, the United States not only doesn't lead, it it stops the payments to WHO. It is a force of destruction right now. Uh, and if the best that can be done between the major powers is to be throwing insults and uh, injury at each other, uh, which is what's happening uh, frighteningly right now, we're in a devastation. We're not gonna have a V-shaped recovery. We're not gonna have a recovery if there isn't cooperation between the US and China and Europe and the other regions, yeah. it's not going to happen. And so uh, I never thought I would see it so vividly as this. It was always a theoretical risk for me, not a present uh, immediate reality. 
But uh, your words are inspiring, and uh, and the work of the ICC can be a great bulwark right now. It was made for purpose, oh, yeah. a great bulwark yeah. for helping to hold the world together. Let me turn, if I can, to uh, two uh, great uh, panelists that have been uh, waiting in the wings, and please uh, stay on uh, so we can have a discussion all together. Eric, uh, as a Kieli, uh, you founded the first B Corp in Italy. You've been a leader of the B Corp movement. Uh, you uh, have uh, two other great uh, um, business uh, leaders uh, that have uh, made remarks before. I'd like you to jump into the discussion to tell us what you're seeing, what we should be doing. I see the Declaration of Interdependence behind you. Uh, so please uh, 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 come <laughs> forward and uh, uh, help create uh, an even bigger movement. And uh, yeah, we uh, need to unmute Eric. <laughs> Our managers. Okay, I think Great. I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and uh, yes, thank you for for uh, having me here. And uh, uh, I have to correct. I didn't found uh, the first B Corp. I co-founded with uh, Paolo Di Cesare. So uh, everything we do is a collective effort, and uh, it's not me and Paolo. It's a global movement of thousands and thousands of business leaders. And I think they are leaders now more than ever because they recognize there are higher priorities. And I think this is the, the biggest uh, opportunity in the history of business to, to show uh, the very reason why business was invented. Originally, it was not invented to maximize shareholders' value, it was invented to satisfy human needs because no one alone could do it. And so what is very interesting is that this concept is starting to, to spread like wildfire around the planet. And uh, about 15 years ago, there, were, there was a group of entrepreneurs, mostly in the United States, but very soon also in Latin America and Europe, all over the planet, they started to say, we need to redesign the very purpose of business in society. Because if we don't do it, what we are going to go through is a systematic uh, uh, depletion of social system, of natural system, a systematic degradation of the biosphere and society, because this is what happens when a business is acting based on the, the dominant uh, paradigm, which is extracting and concentrating value more and more. So this is the, the shift which is happening right now. And I think now with COVID, there is really the opportunity to accelerate this shift. So uh, I see also in Italy, businesses were so much faster and so much more effective than governments, central local governments in responding to the, the urgency. So David and Paul mentioned it, uh, you know, it was a no brainer. I have to protect my people. I have to protect my clients. I have to protect my community. Now the environment is not the top priority. But the, the uh, thinking about the environment is there more than ever because you realize that if you don't protect the environment, if you not, don't have a healthy biosphere, you cannot have a healthy society. And if you don't have a healthy society, you cannot run a business at all. So this is the, the, the very, very big uh, shift we are seeing happening. And uh, also, you, you mentioned there are uh, 2,800 uh, B Corp. The good news is, uh, is 3,300 now, <laughs> so they are growing quite fast. And this is not just B Corps, because B Corps are based on the robust measurement of everything a company does. I, I say it for those who are not familiar with the concept. So there is this uh, measurement system that uh, allows to understand if a company is taking more value from society and environment than it creates, or is creating more value than it takes. So a company can be measured in its capacity to be really regenerative, because if a business is taking more value than it creates, maybe it's, it's better if it didn't exist at all. So now we have the tools to measure and the big core community across the planet is, is spreading these tools. These tools has also, have also been combined uh, uh, in a big partnership with the United Nations with the Sustainable Development Goals. So now with the same platform of B Corps, it's possible to measure with the SDG Action Manager 
how a company is progressing with respect to the 17 goals. So as Lisa Kingo says, there are no more excuses and, and now all businesses can really understand how they are, they are performing with respect to this. And the, the other component of the, the B Corp movement uh, is the legal form, is the legal status as benefit corporation in the United States, Societat de Beneficio and Interes Colectivo in Latin America, and in Italy, Societa Benefit. So it's a distinctive legal status uh, by which a company writes in its bylaws that the purpose of the company is to create value for both shareholders and stakeholders. So it's a completely different mandate that is assigned from the uh, uh, shareholders to the managers of the company. This opens up a completely new uh, terrain for innovation and, and for impact. So the combination of uh, measurement platforms and legal entity creates a very, very robust ground. And, and we see this as, as a probably a non-negotiable, is a must have for a post-COVID society. Because if we don't transform business from the roots, we are just going to perpetuate the same problems we've been creating over time. So I think now is, is the time to move in this direction. And another good news is this one. When we founded Nativa uh, as the first B Corp and Benefit Corporation in Europe, not, not just in Italy, we, we didn't know this was the case. And when we went to the Chamber of Commerce, the Italian Chamber of Commerce to register our company, our statute was rejected four times because it was illegal to write that the purpose was to serve shareholders and stakeholders and was rejected also because we wrote that the purpose of the company was the happiness of the people working in the company. So they happiness have... really <laughs> caused a rejection and now we, we laugh at it because actually this kind of statute and our statute has been uh, copied by dozens and dozens of, of other companies and now we have more than 100 big corps and more than 500 uh, benefit corporation or societa benefit in Italy. And what was outrageous just five or six years ago now is becoming just you know obvious. It's plain, it's plain uh, normality, and and we think uh, it must become the mainstream as 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 soon as possible. Thank you. That was wonderful uh, report and wonderful leadership, and uh, very clear that um, we need to build this now. And like you say, it's not an option, it's a necessity. Uh, and it's Absolutely. interesting, of course, uh, mainstream companies uh, in the US adopted the new business roundtable statement about multi-stakeholder, but that's what you have in the charter. Uh, putting it explicitly in the charter also creates a legal framework and, a, uh, and, and an organizational framework that is extremely important. You. Uh, use the word uh, happiness, one of our themes for the 24 hours, and it's a great uh, segue to uh, our uh, very distinguished uh, fellow panelist, Yana Manuel Denev, uh, who is one of the world's uh, leading researchers at Oxford University, uh, at the leader of the Wellbeing Research Center uh, on uh, business, uh, happiness, and sustainable development, uh, kind of a triangle uh, Jana's research, Jana Manuel's research, every you know, side of that, you know, sustainable development and happiness, sustainable development and business, happiness and business. Uh, Jana Manuel, let me turn it over to you. You've been listening with you. You know these leaders. So what, what would you add? Uh, thank you, Jeff. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good to see you all and everybody on, on the call. Um, well, I think our role as academics is to try and put some numbers and dig a bit deeper behind the amazing and inspirational comments and concepts uh, discussed by Paul and David and Eric. And uh, uh, so, Jeff, um, and one example of that is uh, Paul mentioned it, but David and Eric also indirectly, of course, is the, the role and the linkage between sustainable development and human well being. Um, they do go hand in hand, uh, as Paul mentioned. Uh, but you and I, Jeff, we wrote this chapter for the World Happiness Report this year that for the first time also tries to link empirically how achieving the SDGs, according to the SDSN data, uh, correlates with uh, uh, doing well in terms of the world happiness support type measures of well-being in societies, which are all self-reported uh, rankings by people themselves, representative samples in all of the world's countries to see how they are themselves experiencing life. So it's a very it's a subjective measure, but one that's very democratic because it goes straight to people. It's not an index of any kind. 
And so what we found there in line with what Paul's saying is it goes hand in hand. But beyond what Paul was saying, we actually find increasing marginal returns to sustainable development. So achieving the SDGs, more of that, more doing of that is increasingly leading to or translating into human well-being. And so the reason why you find such a big difference between, for example, the Scandinavian countries in terms of well-being as compared to, say, the United States, the United States, and they do have about a whole point difference on a scale from one to ten, which is massive in our world, is completely driven by doing much, the Scandinavian countries doing much better than uh, in terms of the SDGs, achieving those. And I'm thinking not just countries, but organizations and companies within that. And so there's a lot to be said for sustainable development and the link to happiness. So it's so pleased, uh, so pleasing to see this to be the main link uh, or the main theme of, 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 Earth Day, of Earth Day. Two other quick points that were raised that I want to like that would like to put some numbers behind it because we, we looked into those. One is um, uh, the notion of uh, unemployment, um, heavily referred to by Paul, and for good reason because the big drops that we see in life satisfaction or the increases in worry and stress. And to give you an example, in the United States, since March, we've seen daily experience of stress and worry risen from 40%, already very high, to 60% through the crises. So that is huge. That is, the, those are the, the increases in worry and anxiety, the drops in life satisfaction that we're picking up. We haven't seen any, any time before. So even the Great Recession didn't have that much impact on people's well-being metrics. Um, as Paul mentioned, most of this is probably running through job insecurity and a lot of people actually losing their jobs. So if in the US, the unemployment um, applications for unemployment benefits have now risen to over 20 million people in the space of the last four, four or five weeks. It's uh, close to 2 million uh, in the UK and, uh, and many more in furlough, which is uh, not great either, uh, but not quite uh, unemployment as of yet. And the reason why I think um, the job insecurity or actually being made redundant is the key sort of path for why we're seeing these drops in well-being is because um, being made redundant um, is more than just losing income. Um, it's also losing uh, a part of your identity, self-esteem, losing a big chunk of your social networks, and losing a daily routine, which we now find to be indeed very important for a lot of people, even when they have a job. And so and it's these yeah, non- well, well, well. Yeah. If I could add, in the United States, losing your job is often losing uh, any kind of healthcare coverage as well. Uh, we don't have a social safety net in the United States. Uh, we have a, a, a very harsh uh, social order. And if you lose the job, uh, you don't know how you're going to face an illness. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So that's even more relevant in the case of the U.S. It's luckily less relevant in the case yep. of the U.K. where we have the, the, uh, the National Health Service. Um, so to just make this point in numbers, so when we when we look at people with a job versus without a job, we find that there's a 20% difference in their life satisfaction. And only half of that is explained through the difference in income. The other half is the non-pecuniary aspects that we just outlined. Um, and so I think when people think about, okay, so we're losing income, GDP per capita, but really we're losing much more than just income. We're losing uh, much more if we just if we consider the well-being. Uh, impact, which is a more holistic measure, I think, of the of, of the impact of the crises, uh, in addition to the lives lost, needless to say. Um, uh, and what I find uh, comforting, especially in the UK, and it poses a nice contrast with the US again, is that in the United Kingdom, I think they've gotten this message. So our Chancellor of the Exchequer, our, our Minister of Finance, if you will, has a, a massive job retention scheme, will, which will be costing billions and billions and billions. But its aim is to keep people in jobs and on the payroll, um, even if it is without doing much work. Whereas in the US, the focus has much more been on replacing lost income. So, for example, Trump signing his $1,200 checks to every family is, uh, is helpful, but doesn't only replace the income bit of the, of the potential loss uh, in people's jobs. And so that is something to consider. And I find some countries have will cope better, and some societies, some companies also, because this can be... a uh, at a more micro level as well, will cope better with um, uh, with uh, the way that they deal with with the, uh, the the fallout of COVID-19. The other thing that Paul also mentioned, and I, that I know Jeff, you care much about as well, is inequality. So while uh, we're all uh, uh, meant to be equal, the, the COVID-19 is impacting everybody very very differently. And there's a number of axes of inequality. I think uh, one not mentioned yet uh, is uh, age, which is why I want to highlight it. Um, so, for example, in the labor force, uh, we now have new surveys coming out from a colleague of mine here at Oxford Economics Department 
showing that um, the 20 to 40 year olds are twice as likely to lose their jobs. So they have, um, so they're much more at risk than the elderly and then also elderly uh, labor force. Uh, it's also in part because the sectors that are being um, targeted, let's say the retail sector, um, uh, food, uh, food and the, the food, the restaurant, the tourism, has obviously has a, an over, over proportion of people that are younger rather than older. So you see a number of inequalities. In addition to the inequality, obviously, that Paul has already highlighted, which is, um, and then one thing just to um, also note is that what we now call the essential workers um, are precisely the, the workers that we've uh, um, not done much justice in the past. So my, my, so if we look at the people, the cashiers in the supermarkets, the lorry drivers, the, uh, the, the frontline um, uh, public health uh, system staff, the nurses, uh, I, I do think, who are now also putting their own lives at risk uh, uh, because they're much more in contact with the virus. So the inequalities uh, that are being laid there. And then one thing, of course, I think uh, we're all quite lucky to have a nice home or access to some green space, but um, not everybody does. And so the socioeconomic status the differences that this has also revealed in the way that we're all experiencing um, uh, the COVID-19. So one of my colleagues was always emphasizes, imagine uh, not being in a house or a villa or uh, uh, that we are, but being in a council flat with a uh, domestic, uh, with a, a, say an abusive father in a room where you school used to be your way of getting out of the situation. Uh, and now you're stuck uh, for months, potentially on end. So the so the yeah there's a number of inequalities I think that will um, that will come through and that we're starting to get a, an empirical grip on in the surveys that we're running. Uh, but generally speaking, again, I mean, uh, amazing points being made by David, you, Jeff, Paul, Eric, and uh, it's our job to put numbers behind this uh, and to back them up, uh, which we are. Yeah, Manuel, well, thank you for that great work, and I know that you're working around the clock every day, harvesting the data, information to help uh, guide. And can I, can I uh, ask, uh, as in, in conclusion, as we come to an end, how do we move to B government like B, uh, B Corp? Uh, you know, we have not had B government uh, in, uh, in the United States during this crisis, in many other countries. Government uh, seem to have lost the way of uh, resilience, preparedness, uh, fair response. Uh, government, uh, you know, became very self-serving, uh, very neglectful, uh, in some cases, uh, utterly abusive of its population. It's not clear who the shareholders are uh, for Bolsonaro or for Trump or for others. How do we move to uh, be government? Uh, what uh, could we take from your movement to say what we really need, as Paul said, is new governance? Can we put a charter of be government together from the B Corp movement? Paul. Oh. No, it's a good idea. Where you see is when, when we don't take care of these issues that we talked about, like inequality, and then related to uh, playing around with our planetary boundaries, we actually create more populism and nationalism and tend to bifurcate and get more extreme in the political parties. So as a precondition, addressing these issues that we talked today is very important. The second thing I wanted to point out was the uh, happiness report. If you look at the top countries, I'm in Switzerland myself now, I'm from the Netherlands, we are in the top 10, but in the top 10 countries, I think five or six from memory are, are led by female leaders, Denmark, Norway, Finland, Iceland, New Zealand, Taiwan. So there's a message there. I think they're more human. We need, to, we need to bring back humanity. Just like the B Corp movement brought humanity back to business, we see this crisis bringing humanity back to business. We need humanity back in government. And that's, that's a very important thing. So that's point number two. And then point number three is obviously uh, the enormous opportunity that we now have. Uh, we need to demand from our leaders that the money that we spend is spent behind the right things. It is clear now, for example, that uh, as we want to restart the economy again, it is better to restart it with green jobs. It creates more jobs. It creates better jobs. It also creates an environment where poorer people are more inclusive and suffer less from it. It now makes economic sense. Jeffrey started this uh, broadcast with a price of oil that is zero or negative. In my thinking, but simple as it may be, if the price is zero or negative, it's better to leave it in the ground. Yes. It doesn't make any sense to pay money to take it out. So we are at this point now, I think, that the whole world is saying move forward and move forward faster. Even bigger companies like Shell are now making commitments in line with the Paris Agreement. 
still a challenge, but at least they're making it. So we're at this point now that we as citizens of this world need to demand that transition. And the best way we can do that is to support companies like the B Corps um, that actually are showing this more holistic multi-stakeholder approach and are actually to service for society and not making it worse. And the best thing we can do is to put in the right uh, politicians. For which may I end on a hopeful note, the upcoming November elections will undoubtedly be very crucial for the world, not only for the country in question. Let's hope that that's a hopeful note indeed. Uh, and thank you for mentioning uh, the women leaders in, uh, in Asia, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand. Uh, is uh, considered uh, to be the exemplar of the COVID uh, epidemic uh, leadership. Early action, decisive, fair, huge approval ratings, uh, and uh, more proof of uh, your proposition. Let think me how much better this panel could have been, Jeffrey. <laughs> Let me thank all of you for you know really fantastic discussion, but. So many rich ideas. Uh, can, and Erica, would, would you like to make a word? Yeah, please. Before we close, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, could you give Eric the microphone, please? Yeah, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, uh, with the very strong request from the Italian B Corp community, but the same is happening uh, all over the planet, B Corps are convening their energies to uh, uh, have an impact on policy making, so to become political actors in the best possible way you can imagine. And also, uh, this should have happened uh, in October, uh, a global gathering called the Regeneration 2030, and now we are seeing in what ways it could happen, but it's really a call for action for uh, regeneration, happiness, and climate action, and calling together all business leaders, uh, uh, policymakers, academia, and also spiritual leaders, so that we convene in, in this direction and promote more advanced form of government. So there are so many things happening and I hope, uh, I'm sure we can join forces to, to accelerate this necessary shift. Perfect final words. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the leadership. Stay safe, uh, be well, continue to promote uh, the common uh, benefit of humanity, which all of you are doing. You're all really wonderful uh, and inspiring leaders. Uh, Sharon, let me turn it back over to you. We've reached the end of uh, our hour, but uh, the day continues around the world. Uh, we're going to Colombia, to the Andes, to the Amazon. Uh, Sharon, back to you. Thank you, everyone. I'm sure, uh, we weren't able to get to everyone's questions, but you can tweet us at uh, the World Happiness Report on Twitter. But now I send it back to Caroline Fox, who will continue with the Earth Day celebrations. Again, happy Earth Day, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you to Thank Jeff you. and the wonderful Thank panelists you. for Bye. sharing this conversation with us. This concludes the third session and the first 12 hours of SDSN's global webinar.